to a day in the life. Our guest today is somebody very special, and I'm going to introduce him to you momentarily, but we want to tell you that this is program number 102 in our series. We always like to thank our sponsors, and we especially want to thank our season sponsor for this program. Our season sponsor is Bales Dishaw Wealth Management of RBC Dominion Securities. We're very grateful to Kathy and to Michelle for their continuing support of this series. And I want to thank our program sponsors for this particular program. Our sponsors are two great fans of our guest, Heather Janak and Nicole Woods have sponsored this program. Our next program will be Gord Lacko, and he is a marine consultant who consults to the television and movie industry when they're making maritime-based movies. Well, one of the benefits of doing this program is that I get to meet some wonderful great Canadians and the gentleman I'm about to introduce to you is one of my personal favorites. It's a great thrill to introduce the 20-year host of Sunday Edition on CBC Radio. Welcome to Michael Enright. Hi Michael. Hi you Fred. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Good to see you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I've looked forward to this because You've been coming into our home every week for uh, 20 years plus, so uh, this will be fun. I hope I didn't disrupt things coming in every Sunday morning. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Michael, I want to begin, um, a, a, as I explained to you briefly, we, we try to focus on uh, the inspiration that you had to uh, get into the wonderful career you've had in journalism and, and in radio and also to inspire our guests by using you as an example of, uh, of somebody who succeeded. So we're going to go back and, and uh, tell us about where you were born, please. Uh, I was born in uh, Toronto, in St. Michael's Hospital, in downtown Toronto, and uh, only child. And my parents and I lived in an apartment uh, right in the middle of town. Can you tell us about your dad? My father was, uh, he was trained as a bookkeeper. He worked for Toronto, for Ontario Hydro, uh, publicly owned, and he was very much in favor of that. Uh, my mother was a stenographic typist. She worked for the Department of Motor Vehicles at Queen's Park. One of the things that's always of interest to our viewers is connections to our area. And I understand that you had a summertime connection to the Midland area? My father rented a, you, we used to rent a cottage in Wabash Sheen, okay. uh, which I just adored. It was wonderful. <clears throat> Pardon me. It was about a block from the water. And we'd go there every summer, and um, it was quite fantastic. And while there, um, right next door to the, or right behind the cottage was the local Catholic church. And we being Irish Catholics, of course, we were very attentive to that. And occasionally I would serve Mass there as an altar boy. And from time to time, if I was very lucky, I'd get a ride over to the Martyr Shrine and serve Mass there. Um, I don't think I was a very good server, but at <laughs> least I showed up on time. And that was fun. And then years later, my mother and I used to take the... Um, passenger trips, trash, passenger boats, rather, from Port McNichol, oh, the Assiniboia okay. and the Kiwetan. Yes. And we would take them up the Great Lakes to uh, Fort William, as it then was, and then yeah. around to Duluth and Chicago. We loved that. Oh, wonderful. I, I, I didn't know you had that additional connection. Oh, just delightful. And in fact, a few years ago, I was riding my motorcycle up in the area, and there was a sign that said there was the Kiwaitan Boat Restaurant at Port McNichol. I think it was Port McNichol. Port McNichol so I went over yeah. and looked, I looked at it. And um, hidden fact, Fred, hidden fact, the staircase uh, in the Kiwaitan was designed after the staircase in the Titanic. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can use that, by the way. You can oh, have that. That's that's a valuable piece of information. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Michael, I'm interested. You were a, a lead altar boy. Uh, senior. Senior. Senior altar boy, yes. A master of ceremonies, actually. <laughs> yeah. That's which, what they called us. Which, having heard some of your editorial comments, uh, may not have stuck. Uh, you mean about the Roman Catholic Church? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, it was only later in life that I uh, I came to um, have a series of uh, contretemps with the church. I never intended and would never intend to insult the personal faith of ordinary Catholics. But what always bothered me was the political aspect of the church um, as manifest in the Curia. The Curia is the political office of the Vatican. Right. And... Um, those people, and they stood in the way of all kinds of reforms in the church, the ordination of women, um, the, the whole question of papal infallibility, all those things, very conservative, uh, but uh, populated by some of the best 17th century minds uh, in existence. But I really hated their idea of authority and and how we were all, it's not without meaning that parishioners are referred to as the flock because the curia always looked on us as sheep. Mm -hmm. And you've never been a great lover of authority. I don't know what makes you say that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I used to get in all kinds of trouble with, uh, in school, later in high school. Um, because I was always asking why, or how do you know that? Um, and teachers in those bygone years um, would make assertions uh, and uh, as if they were spoken truth. But I always want to know, where did you get that? How come? Why? And I think that genetically... Um, built in my desire to be a reporter. Mm -hmm. Michael, did you have any uh, teachers or principals in your schooling that had a, an impact on, on you, who you turned out to be, and uh, the interests that you developed? Uh, there, I can think of three, actually. Um, in my parish school, Holy Rosary School, the, the principal was named Sister Anne Francis. She was wonderful, tough, but fair. One time I was fooling around in the classroom. I was playing with a basketball. I threw the ball up at the front and knocked the head off the statue of St. Joseph. She took me behind the uh, cloakroom and gave me the strap. And I could tell she was almost in tears having to do it. Um, she made my parents pay for the head of the statue. Uh, when I left that, went to high school. I went to St. Michael's uh, High School, the hockey school. Uh, I was kind of a weirdo, well, not kind of, I'm <laughs> certainly a weirdo because uh, I um, went to the most famous hockey school in the world and couldn't skate. But I had Dave, I had Dave Keon in my French class. He sat in front of me. And then, here's where the authority came in again. I, uh, the French teacher, uh, Dave's first language was French. Yes. And the French teacher, we were doing, uh, reading Jules Verne around the world in 80 days. And the French teacher used to give Dave a really hard time for his pronunciation. But he was fluent. He was from Roy and Miranda, and he was fluently uh, bilingual. Uh, the other person was Father David Bauer. Yes. Uh, Father Bauer's brother, uh, Bobby Bauer, was a member of the Kraut Line, which was a famous hockey, t uh, hockey line in Boston. Right, Milt Schmidt and Woody Dumart, and they all came from Kitchener. And but Father Bauer was my homeroom teacher for three years. He was a gentle, sometimes not gentle, uh, very decent, warm, encouraging uh, teacher, uh, and a legendary figure. Oh yeah, he invented really uh, international hockey play between Canada and other other countries, right. especially in the junior team. Uh, I used to go out, and Frank Mahalic was a, three years ahead of, four years ahead of me. But I used to go out and watch them play the majors, 
Uh, and it was interesting. We went into the cafeteria for lunch. Uh, the, the hockey players, the, the um, uh, majors would come in all in a group and they go right to the front of the line. <laughs> Everybody would step aside, <laughs> which was great. There are other teachers there, though, who were monsters. So, um, but on balance, no, oh, and, and I can't forget a, a guy named Joe Penny. Father Joe Penny taught me English and got me interested in poetry mm -hmm. and writing. Mm -hmm. He was wonderful. And you went off to a seminary for a brief time. Yes, I did, Fred. <laughs> I, looking back, I wonder if that was one of the most feckless things I've ever done. I joined a, an order called uh, the Passionists. And um, they were headquartered in Dunkirk, New York, the uh, Venice of Mohawk County, uh, <laughs> right on the shores of Lake Erie. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Because I wanted to be a monk. <coughs> Excuse me. I wanted to live with other monks, and I wanted to teach, preferably somewhere uh, across the seas. Um, and I, I read up about the Passionists, and they were they were very interesting, very um, holy, of course, but also very engaged in uh, the Catholic idea of social action, which was uh, begun back in the in the eighteen uh, hundreds, uh, Leo the Thirteenth and and uh, and others. Um, so I went there, yeah, and uh, it was a very interesting experience and you how long were you there what, i was long? there a little more than a year, more than a year. and then and you it was the coldest place we, we, during the winter the shoreline of lake erie would freeze and in the dormitory we all slept under bearskin blankets that had been used by the u.s army in korea <laughs> so we were buried under these smelly um blankets to get up at uh, 5.30, I think, in the morning uh, for morning prayers and breakfast and so on. Um, it, was a, it was a hard life, mm -hmm. but it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Did you go from there to your first employment then uh, when you left the seminary? Well, I came back. I remember taking the train uh, from Dunkirk to Buffalo and then to Toronto. The first thing I did when I got out of the monastery was buy a package of cigarettes <laughs> uh, Paul Mall cigarettes and smoking like crazy. I got back to Toronto. I don't know in an Irish Catholic family, somebody who is in the priest or studying for the priesthood and then comes out. It's a bit like coming out of the pen. Uh, you're, you're a bit of an ex, you have a thing on your forehead saying failure, you know? So I went back to St. Mike's for a year, for my final year. I had intended to stay there through grade 13 and so on. But um, I had this dispute with the teachers. They wanted me to learn stuff, and uh, I, I didn't. So I, I never finished high school. Which is Although I spent, I spent many happy years in grade 12. <laughs> Tell us about your first job. No one will believe this. <laughs> I got a job as a re auto renewal clerk for the Norwich Union Fire Insurance Society. What it was was I had a desk and an adding machine. You remember adding machines? I do. And <laughs> annually, the uh, insurance policies had to be renewed. And I would get the figure of how much we're going to increase the policy this year, 3% or 8% or something. And then I would get on the adding machine and fiddle with that and try and come up with a new premium and then send that off to, uh, I don't know where it went. It just left my desk. Uh, and I had no idea from day one what I was doing. I carried my lunch in a little paper bag and um, it was, uh, it was just, I couldn't figure, I, I didn't know where the stuff came from or where it went. I knew I had to get out. And from there, you began to pursue the course that led you through the rest of your career. Well, I took a night course at U of T on journalism. 
journalism 101, I guess you'd call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was taught by a McLean's editor. And it was part of the uh, ongoing education series, whatever. I turned out to be very good at it uh, uh, in terms of how to write a lead, you know, and uh, all those things, the inverted paragraph, uh, pyramid, all that. And so I started to look around for jobs. And there was an ad for the Barry Examiner uh, for a junior reporter. And I thought, that's interesting. Uh, and the next, I wrote an application. And the next day, there was an ad for the Brampton uh, Times and Conservator. Guess what political party it supported? Um, anyway, I, being a city kid, Barry and Brampton, they're all the same. I mean, they could have been in northern Quebec for all I knew. <laughs> so I went up to the Greyhound bus terminal um, <clears throat> on Bay Street, and I, it was a cheaper ticket to, to get, get to Brampton, Brampton than yeah. it was to Barry. Yeah. So I went to Brampton, and I met the editor, and then I met the publisher and so on, and they, t they hired me. That was in 1961. So I was a kid reporter. I did everything. Took pictures, developed them, reported at city council, courts, police, everything. So the inspiration from this, Michael, is that for young people watching, when they go to seek a job, buy the cheapest bus ticket. <laughs> Get out of town. Get that out is of town. My, that that is my <laughs> advice it, it, because what's happened to journalism and the jobs is so awful that. The best thing is to try and get to a small town. Community newspapers, I think, are the blood of journalism in this country. And but there are so few of them left. It's terrible. It's just appalling, yeah. I'd often thought I'd, I'd quit the CBC. Why would anybody quit the CBC? Anyway, um, <laughs> I often thought I'd love to go and work on a small town paper. Now, you worked on others. You went from Brampton to... I went to, from Brampton. Well, I, I got into a spot of bother in Brampton. I, we had these country correspondents who sent in obits of people who died, but they used... And they must have used bowling pencils or something because it was very hard to read. And I would rewrite the death, the, the obit, and uh, it was Mrs. Claire O'Malley who died suddenly. And I, well... Mrs. O'Malley phoned the paper and said it was my husband who died. And the publisher called me into his office. He said, this is not good. So I knew he was going to get rid of me. So I went down the highway to Kitchener and got an interview with the Kitchener Waterloo Record. I went on there on the record for two or three years. Wonderful paper. Mm -hmm. Family owned. John Motes was the family. Uh, again, I covered the politics and cops. And then they made me religion editor which was a heck of a lot of fun. It was terrific. Mm -hmm. There were some odd things that happened, but but it was a great beat. Michael, Obits have gotten other people in trouble with their jobs. In our local radio station, when it was years ago, when it was very much a local radio station, an announcer came on and in sonorous tones announced, we regret to advise that there are no obituaries to report today. <laughs> there was a program in Kitchener that was sponsored by the local funeral home. And it, all it was was death notices. Yeah, isn't that great? That was amazing. Yeah. Now, after that, you left the country. Got out of the country, went to London. Decided I wanted to write a novel. Oh. Um, in fact, this was in 62, I guess. Um, crossing the ocean on a canard liner was terrific. Uh, didn't get seasick at all. Got to London. I knew a couple of people in London. Uh, went to work for Reuters, the news agency. Mm -hmm. We hired a lot of Canadians on what was called Nordesk. I wound up on the West Indies and Caribbean desk, covering mostly yacht fires, <laughs> uh, which can get a little tedious after after a while. I was terrible at that, and I was fired after two weeks by uh, the managing editor, named, his name was Farmer. So I got uh, a job working for a Welsh television company called TWW, Television Wales in the West, to Lady Cymru. And I wrote continuity 
You know, you know what I'm saying? Tonight at nine, Batman takes on the Joker, that kind of thing. Uh, and I was in an office with four women in Knightsbridge. And again, it was one of those things. That everything was above. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was doing it. And it was fun. Uh, I was living in Putney Bridge. I had a little bed sit there, and uh, I enjoyed it. But I wanted to get into journalism, and it, it was clear I wasn't going to do it um, in England. And what was clear was that I didn't have the talent to write a novel. So I came home. And uh, you began with The Globe? Was that your first? Then I started with The Globe. I tried to get into The Globe, The Star, The Telly, anybody. Yeah. Uh, and The Globe took me on. Clark Davy, the late Clark Davy, wonderful ME, uh, managing editor, said, we never hire anybody without a degree. And I said, well, not only do I not have a degree, uh, but I never finished grade eight. I, I never finished grade 12. Yeah. Uh, and he looked at me, he said, I'll give you two weeks probation, and then you're gone. And frankly, I don't think you're going to make it. So I wrote some stuff for two weeks, and then he came in. Uh, uh, actually, we were in the bathroom, in the uh, washroom, and um, at adjoining urinals, and he said, okay, kid, three months. You got three months probation. And then that's where it started. I stayed six years, six or seven. Wow. I loved it. More fun. It was just, I covered Queens Park. Uh, John Robarts was the premier. And there wasn't a day that we just didn't fall down laughing. It was just, it was just amazing. I loved it. I just loved it. I loved the globe. Because mm -hmm. they let you write. They let you do what they hired you to do. And your print journalism took you to Time magazine for a while? I left, yeah, I left to go, went to Time in Montreal. And then you were at McLean's, where you became? Well, <laughs> or was I was hired away from Time to do a local radio, CBC radio program oh. called Daybreak, which right. was a morning show. Right. And from six to nine in the morning. Now, English language radio in those days in Montreal, Talk about minority listening. Um, I don't think our immediate families listen to the <laughs> programming. Um, I really wasn't very, I, although I was the last person, I think, on the network to actually read a commercial. We had commercials in those days. Remember, it was direct film and Dorian Suits were our two sponsors. And every Friday, this young man came in <clears throat> pardon me, to talk about famous speeches. And his name was Conrad Black. Really? Yeah, yeah. He's the, as you know, the British uh, oh, yeah. journalist. Yeah. He's been a guest on this program. Yes. Has he indeed? Yes. Well, he came in every, every, and I remember one time he came in, he was going to talk about the Gettysburg Address or something. And I said, yeah, this is true, it's Friday morning, terrific. We'll be back right after this message from Direct Film with Conrad Hall. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, what did you say? I said, God, I'm sorry. I didn't. I'm very tired. I don't think. Conrad Hall is a B actor from old time movies. <laughs> so we came off the commercial. And I said, well, you can tell it's Friday. I don't know what I'm doing here. I really apologize to our guest, Mr. Conrad Hall. <laughs> I said it the second time. Anyway, I didn't like getting up at four in the morning in February and walking down Cote de Neige the wind and the so i quit and started to freelance magazine writing i think i sold two pieces in a year and then um keith spicer with whom i'd worked in at the globe mail was the commissioner of official languages and he called me and said he wanted me to be his press secretary uh okay. my my french was terrible faible um but i went to ottawa and worked for him. And then in a strange sort of way, the star heard about me and hired me. Great. Now you came back to CBC as, as, as I understand it in 1985. No, uh, no, I came back to replace Peter Zosky. Okay. In, in ni 1974. Four. Yes. Okay. That and was, you... that was what I call my suicide mission. That was a long, long term job replacing Peter Zosky. Just unbelievable. <laughs> I was hired 
I was hired in, in July, and then we went to air in September, and I was fired in February. So there you go. I wasn't warm enough. And Pete was warm, as we all yes. know. Yes. Yeah. Or as he so, said, if, if you can fake that, you can fake anything. <laughs> you know. So you came back then a decade or so later, and that's when you uh, were the managing editor of CBC Radio News? Yeah, I went into management for my sins. Uh, right. Uh, That'll get uh, you. In the, say again? That'll get you. Oh, in those days, though, we really had a news department. Yes. Uh, I think my budget was $29 million a year. We had hundreds of employees. We had foreign bureaus. Um around the world and we had i think it was the gold standard in terms of ottawa political reporting uh people like ken mccreese and brian kelleher and these wonderful wonderful reporters uh, but i did that for three years and then uh i went home one night and oh i know what happened i got a note an email saying uh, that you'll be eligible for your pension uh, eligible for retirement july the 4th 2000 and five or something and i went home and i told my late wife janet that i've got to get out of here or i'm going to lose my immortal soul um, <laughs> do you mind if i quit <clears throat> and she said you do do what you want if you have to quit quit which i did and got out of it but they got you back again on air well they let me audition for as it happens yes but it had to be kept a secret because they didn't want anyone to know that a manager would actually walk away from a job for life right. to go on the air, which is right. a little more precarious. So the, the head of current affairs rented a hotel, <laughs> literally rented a hotel room uh, in downtown Toronto and uh, uh, interviewed me. And, and, and he said, what, why, would you, why would we hire you? What, what, what do you bring to the program that others wouldn't? And I said vulnerability, because I think the all-knowing host idea is bizarre. It's preposterous. Yeah. We don't know everything. I don't care about everything. Uh, and neither does the listener. That's so another way in which, in which you differ from Zosky, who did Well, know. oh, he and I got into a dreadful argument one time. He had heard the show, as it happens, the night before, and somebody had come on scientist something i don't know and i said i'm sorry i don't didn't understand a word you said could you <laughs> could you repeat that using small words yeah. and the next morning zosky just tore us through you never say you don't know it's your job to know you can't let the listener down yeah. well i didn't agree with them then certainly don't agree with them now well you had a long run michael and as it happens you're 10 years 10 yeah. years with uh, Alan Maitland and then with Barbara Budd, a couple of great CBC names. Was it fun to work with Maitland? He was, you have to understand, Fred, that in, that, in those years, CBC Radio was, was populated by eccentric staff announcers, gone off to war, survived and come back. And they were some of the weirdest people I've ever met. Uh, wonderful, professional, top-notch people. And Maitland was one of them. Alan always said that he was responsible for starting the Kingston, uh, the, Kingston, the uh, Halifax Naval Riots in 1945. <laughs> he was walking down a street. He saw a liquor store. He smashed a window and grabbed a bottle of rum. And then all hell broke loose and the cops came. And that was the Halifax riot. I don't believe him for a moment, but he said that. It's a great story. He, he had the best pipes of any announcer I've ever heard anywhere, yeah. any BBC, whatever. Uh, and his storytelling uh, of um, the shepherd or front porch owl or, or yeah. just um, terrific. And we used to kid in the studio. One time we went live, we went live every night, but. He hit the button. He said, uh, good evening. I'm Michael Enright. <laughs> and I said, you are? Really? And we broke, broke up and felt. <laughs> so we went to music, came back, and then we both started talking at the same time. So it was just, we, we couldn't get through the thing. 
<laughs> That's fine. And the producer said, that was a disaster. We have to edit it out going west. And, and Mate said, that was the funniest thing that's ever happened to me in broadcasting. Yeah. And we're going to lose it, you know? Yeah. The other time was the year where the producer said, I do not want to hear the word Christmas on the radio. Happy holidays, happy festival time. But if I hear the word Christmas, some things will happen. But on that night, <laughs> hit the mic at 5.30, 5.31, and Maitland said, good evening, I'm Alan Maitland, and a very Merry Christmas to all our listeners. <laughs> Which was great. Oh, that's funny. I had a lot of fun. From there you went to this morning, uh, a program. Yes, that had a new program. Morningside. Yeah, we replaced Morningside. Yeah, and you did that with Avril Benoit for a couple of years, and then, as I understand it, that split into a weekday and Sunday programming. I have to, yes, I have to explain. The first broadcast, the first weekend that the program was going to be broadcast was the death of Lady Diana. Oh, that we had a whole program planned. We had to throw it away. Um, and, um, we had a big meeting on the Sunday and we said, what the hell do we do? We, and I said, well, look, why don't you send one of us, Avril or me to London and we'll do the show from London and Toronto, uh, which happened. I went to London, she stayed and we did this whole, and the papers went crazy. They said, it certainly isn't morning sign. This is journalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and did that for three years, and then, you're right, it split off. The Sunday edition, the title of it was, it was the Sunday edition of This Morning. I see, okay. Well, that's how many of our younger viewers will know you, is from the program Sunday edition. So let's talk about it. Sure. Um, you said that it was the greatest experience and challenge in your career as a journalist. What yes, I stand by that. <laughs> How, uh, what was different about it than, than what you'd done before? What I said was, in the beginning, was that I don't want to duplicate other programs. Now, everybody says that. Yeah. It's very hard not to. But I pushed it a bit. I pushed the envelope a bit. I said, look, if somebody else does it, we don't. Unless we can take something and make it our own, and the modern word, 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 which I hate, is brand. Yes. But if we can make it our own, okay. If we can't, we won't do it. Right. Secondly, every program proposal has to be based on an idea. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be in a story meeting and, and hear somebody say, well, let's do something on the budget. No, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The third element was that there were three pillars for the program. Long-form interviews. Yeah. music, and documentaries, right. and all three are important. And that's what we set out to do. One of the things that you, and I, I was a huge fan of both the program and you personally. I, I well, often you. listen to it uh, later uh, or earlier because it was, it's available before yeah. the morning uh, online. Um, one of the things you achieved that, that fascinates me is the way you related to your audience. Everybody who listened to that show thought they knew you. And you have a big audience in the community that will be watching this. And everybody kind of thought Michael Enright was you know, their friend or in their circle. I guess today we'd say in their bubble. <laughs> well, I don't think there's a greater compliment that can be paid <clears throat> to someone who to some broadcaster. That's the whole reason that I put radio above every other media form. It's the intimacy. Mm -hmm. It's instantaneous. It's immediate. Um, and when my wife died, my first wife died uh, in 1990, and there was an outpouring from the audience. There were hundreds and hundreds of letters this was pretty much before email that were extraordinary in terms of my loss became their loss in a sense. 
I don't want to be metaphysical about it, but that that was it. And I would meet people who, and I still hear from people whose perhaps their parent was had a terminal illness or uh, was in a nursing home, that kind of thing. Uh, and the, the program and some of the things I said had an impact on, on, the, on the people they loved. And you don't get that kind of intimacy with any, you don't get it in print. You don't certainly don't get it in television. Yeah. You don't get it in movies or whatever, but this is right there. And that's why it's so important now, more important now than it was when I started that the public broadcaster be protected and, and be allowed to flourish because we've never been in need of it more. Michael, you said that the Sunday audience listens differently. It does. It Explain does. That. Explain I, that. Because I, I know I didn't listen differently. Monday to Friday, you want the weather, you want the traffic, you want to know what's happened in town, in Toronto. Sadly, it's what was the latest shooting over the weekend. Um, and it has to be quick and smart and, and tell you, it set up the day for you. Mm -hmm. And during the course of that day, you are flooded with information, not understanding, not context, not wisdom, but information. Yeah. By the time the weekend rolls around, it's my view the audience has had enough, had enough news. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the time that Sunday came around, Sunday was a day of rest. And people wanted something different. They wanted relief. They wanted some kind of attachment to a program that says, yeah, it's a pretty crappy world, but here's this. This is very interesting, or here's that, and so on. And I think that also found a home with, uh, with the listener. They're tired, and they're... Um, I got a letter one year from a United Church minister in uh, Weyburn, Saskatchewan, home of Tommy Douglas, as you know. And he said, I'm thinking of moving my 9 o'clock service up to the parking lot because people are sitting in their cars <laughs> listening to your radio program. And I said, don't do that, Pastor. I said, um, but it became, and the thing that was really gratifying, it wasn't my program so much. It was theirs. They own it. They pay for it. Yes. They pay my salary. They pay for the microphones. They pay for the studio. So yeah. This is re the propriety, the proprietorship of the Sunday edition and indeed of CBC Radio by Canadians is really gratifying, very exciting. Your program's been described as being fiercely intelligent. And, and it is... Um, it, I, I suspect that some of the people who are watching this will be astounded that you don't have grade 12 because you're, the breadth of your interests and the depth of your understanding on so many different topics from music, uh, opera, to, to well, the, 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 your, your knowledge of what's going on in the world, your, the, the things you've read. Um, how does a guy who dropped out of grade 12, and this is for those who want to be inspired, Michael, how does a guy... Well, I don't recommend it. <laughs> it wasn't a, a step. <laughs> the first, on your first point, uh, intelligent, whatever that quote was, yeah. uh, I read a biography of Harold Lasky, the left-wing socialist head of the London School of Economics, and he said it was his job to encourage people to the... Um, subversiveness of thought. And I love that. Mm -hmm. That to me was, because thinking is, read Orwell, thinking is sub subversive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to say this modestly, so I'll say it. I have a freakish memory. Um, I was tested when I was a kid. I do not have a photographic memory, mm -hmm. but I do have what's called ten a retention um uh, total recall. Uh, if you tell me your birthday, I'll never forget it for some reason, because I will connect it to other things. Mm -hmm. Really, you were born December 7th, 1941. That's Pearl Harbor. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, 
I can remember my father's first license plate for the first car we have, 259E7. Yeah. It's, it's no talent. It's, it's like having a trick knee. Or those people that can bend their thumbs back, you know, yeah. it, that's what it, it's a fluke. You were born with it. Yeah, I was born, with, but without it, I wouldn't, I'd be a squeegee kid. I mean, uh, and it saved me so many times um, when I'm interviewing someone. I interviewed Alan Arkin one time. He said, how did you know that? Well, you know, I happen to remember something. And, um uh, uh, I interviewed George C. Scott after his PR guy had whispered, you know, he's hammered. If he doesn't like the question, he'll punch <laughs> you right in the face. Um, but I quoted a line that George C. Scott used in uh, The Hustler, and he was sort of amazed by that. You have one of the things that shines through, and, and, and this is in part because of my professional background, Michael, you have a real passion for justice. How did you develop that? Is that through your personal experience or through the experience of others around you? Well, without giving offense, or even with giving offense, I uh, grew up uh, in an Irish Catholic household where the weight of 900 years of oppression by the English was really felt around the dinner table. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't like what the English had done. Um, and I was always um, alert to people of authority using it harshly against people without it. Yes. And it made me it made me mad, quite frankly. It made me angry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could see it everywhere. And I grew up, you know, well, I was a teenager in the in the time of the uh, lunch counter sit-ins, uh, the Freedom Freedom Summer, the Freedom Riders, the whole civil rights movement, the murder of the three civil rights workers, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney. It changed my life. Uh, they were in Mississippi trying to get the vote out. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, I don't know. I just, I don't know where it comes from. I just get angry. I guess that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I we used to have arguments with producers. We always put the victim on the radio, the, the person who was cut off welfare and, you know, and single, single mother and so on. I don't want to talk to her. I want to talk to the bad guys. I want to talk to the person who did it yeah, yeah. and leave that poor woman alone. Give me the bad guy who did it. And bad guys are far more interesting to interview. Let's talk about some of the people you've interviewed because sure. you've had fascinating experiences. Who would you say you felt the most honored to have the opportunity to interview? Honored? Honored. Wow. Uh... I interviewed Queen Noor of Jordan once. That was quite, that was an honor. Um, I really, I didn't think of it as an honor. I always thought it, it was a, it was luck. It was a lucky break for the kid mm -hmm. from who grew up on Earl Street. Yeah. Uh, so when I used to talk to Christopher Hitchens, for example. Yes. Uh, I was, I was just in awe of his mind and his, um, his powers of, of attention and oratory and so on. I interviewed him a number of times. He was probably the smartest person I've ever interviewed. Uh, there was, there've been some disasters, but I think mostly uh, uh, ordinary people. Mm -hmm. It's an honor to talk to the ordinary Canadians. It's an honor to talk to them. You know, what was uh, the funniest moment you had doing Sunday well, edition? Oh, uh, there were so many, all of them embarrassing. Uh, I was once told uh, live that we were doing a thing on Tibet uh, <clears throat> and the Chinese and the Dalai Lama, all of that. Mm -hmm. And two Tibetan monks were traveling Canada to raise funds. And they were ushered into the studio. And the producer leaned down and said, I think the one on the right speaks English, <laughs> which is not the best start it's for not not good research either, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> anyway, the thing was, they couldn't speak. 
um, uh, English, and I had given up my Tibetan studies years ago. Um, so the whole thing was a complete fiasco. And at one point, I looked through the, the control room to the studio. <coughs> Pardon me. I looked through the studio to the control room, and I couldn't see anybody. Nobody's head was above the counter because they were all on the floor laughing at me. Um, that was that was perhaps the funniest. One of the interviews I did was with King Hussein of Jordan, Queen Nora's oh, wife. Yes. Yeah. And we were lucky to get him. And I was a show off. You know, well, Your Majesty, can you, when you look at the two state solution, what exactly do you mean? How do you think? And I went on and blabbing and blabbing. I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> and he said, Well, uh, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm afraid I've forgotten the question. <laughs> you repeat it? And I said, Your Majesty, I hate to tell you, but I forgot it as well. Yeah. <laughs> so that was embarrassing. <laughs> um, now, foreign yeah. interviews are tricky, so, you know, because there are accents involved. I was going to ask about one of those. There was a Bosnian Serb former politician. Uh, with whom you had a oh yes a, a, a bit of a a blunt question. Can you set that one up for us? Well, Radovan Karadzic was the head of the Bosnian Serbs, and his mission in life was to extirpate uh, Bosnian Muslims. Uh, he was a poet and a psychiatrist, and he always considered himself the smartest person, not just in the room but in the country. We got him on the air. And I was reading a script, and it was good, but it was all political and real politics. And why do you, you know, when, and I thought, the hell with this. If I were interviewing Hitler, I wouldn't read a thing. So I threw the script away. I said, tell me, Ms. Karadich, how's the ethnic cleansing coming along? <laughs> well, he exploded. <laughs> there is no ethnic cleansing. Blah, blah. Uh, the producer in the glass, through the glass said, well, we'll never get him again. Got him every time we phoned because wow. he thought he could. Oh, Mr. Mike. Oh, yeah, I can. Yeah. And the Atlantic magazine, for some reason, wrote a, wrote a feature about that question and about, uh, <clears throat> about as it happens. Yeah. But he later went to jail for life, I think, at The Hague. Right. You also had fun on April Fool's Day um, with uh, someone that sounded like Jimmy Carter. <laughs> we, Jimmy Carter had written an op-ed page in the New York Times criticizing Canada for stumpage fees. <laughs> and until that moment, I didn't know what stumpage fees were. It was, it was a subsidy to our forest industry, which he said was dumping and undercutting the American thing. And I thought, you, all right, okay. So I hired a voice actor, a brilliant actor. And I wrote a script. And we started out very ordinary. Mr. President, why? We reached him in Plains, Georgia. Mr. President, tell me exactly what your argument is. I don't quite, well, I think that the Canada has, I think, went on and on and on. And finally, I, I said, well, Mr. President, tell me, why should we pay any attention to a washed up peanut farmer? like yourself <laughs> from uh, uh, a hick town in Georgia. Well, I don't believe you'd say, and he went on and on. It was fabulous. Yeah. And I would, during the course of the evening, I would say, uh, would you speed it up, Mr. President? We don't have much time. Hurry up. Come on, <laughs> say what you're going to say. And it, went, and it was just, um, oh, anyway, it ended. And people were outraged. They were outraged at me. They wanted to hang me. Yeah. The thing I love best about it was that the president of the CBC, Bob Rabinovich, oh, no, I've got to back up. A f the editor, a foreign editor of the Globe and Mail was having a shower, and he had a shower phone. And he heard this interview, and he ran to the typewriter or the computer and wrote a story which ran on the front page of the Globe and Mail. Enright insults Carter, wood chips fly. <laughs> The president of the CBC, Bob Rabinovich, was in London, England. And as you know, when the Air Canada goes, they have the newspapers there. So he, he got the Globe and Mail and saw this thing about Enright. <laughs> he must have had a terrible flight across the ocean. Uh, people were just beside themselves. And finally, the Globe wrote an editorial about how it had been 
taken in. And, um, I found out later, though, that President Carter himself thought it was quite funny. Oh, isn't that wonderful? He, he, he would. would. He would. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. But boy, I got threats. Wow. And even after people knew it was a hoax, one guy said, he stopped me on the way to the subway. He said, um, well, you know, Jimmy Carter builds houses for the poor. And I said, I, I certainly know that, but the actor I hired doesn't build houses <laughs> for the poor. You know, it was very difficult. That's good. One of the guests that you had, who was one of my favorites, was Dick Cavett. Mm. And I must tell you that hearing you and Cavett go back and forth was just an absolute radio joy for me. Total, total gentleman. Just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And I had, I had been a Cavett fan, like you. And, and it was interesting. He came into the studio in New York. It's on 3rd Avenue, near 46th Street. And the woman who runs the uh, studio is, Ger is German, he speaks German. So he's from Nebraska. So he started speaking German to uh, our... And I heard, I overheard this. And um, I said, before it we went on air, I said, excuse me, Mr. Cavett, we're not doing the interview in German. You know that. <laughs> and he said, oh, I thought we were. I said, no, we're doing it in Lithuanian. <laughs> and he laughed. And, I, yeah. and then we did the thing. But he was terrific. Just a real smart gentleman. Yeah. That was great. He sent me his book. He, he autographed it. I must, uh, I must tell you that your final show on June 26 was just such a delight to someone who's followed the, the program um, to hear from so many of those people who become sort of part of our world. Yeah. And who you're very fortunate to spend time with, Paul Rogers and Adam Gopnik. And, and uh, Fred, the whole thing in my case is luck. I'm the luckiest. I've been blessed. Excuse me, I really have been blessed. Well, I don't know anyone else who can call Margaret Atwood Peg. <laughs> <laughs> I've known her for years and years and years. We were friends, uh, still are. I was a friend of her late husband, Graham Gibson. Yeah. Uh, Peggy's a very tough interviewer. You've got to be very, you've got to bring your, your best game with her. She's very uh, smart. Very smart. And one of the things that she does she'll ask you i'll say uh, ms atwood uh, what do you think of the four most important things in writing science fiction novels i don't know michael what do you think <laughs> yeah. that's the thing that the interviewer hates to hates. hear absolutely just oh god don't ask me that please you know um when we did a, a whole series on as it happens on the introduction of the gst I created this thing where I buy a pair of goalie pads for $99.95. And we called the guy at the CRA in Ottawa, tried to get him to explain it to me, which I could never do. <laughs> and uh, I could never understand it. And at one point he said, I'm sorry, I'm not making myself. Do you play hockey, Mr. Enright? <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm not buying any goalie, goalie pads. That's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Michael, you have many, many interests. I've read that you're, you have interests in prison reform and medical pain relief and organ transplants and, yeah. and classical music. We know that from the program. One of your interests, I understand, is very close to you, and that's your advocating for the intellectually disabled. Tell us yes, what you work there. absolutely. Uh, I have a daughter now, Nancy Kathleen. Wonderful. Um, she's in her mid-30s. She was born with what's called a chromosomal deficit. The number 10 chromosome was missing some DNA. So she is developmentally disabled. Uh, she's, well, she's an amazing person. So because of her, um, I've gotten involved with community living, various centers uh, around the province. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and these people are neglected. The parents of these people are tired. They don't march. They don't protest. They don't make signs and go down to Queens Park. They're physically exhausted mm -hmm. taking care of these people. 
you can have people who are 65 years old in diapers living at home. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there again, it's authority could change it overnight, overnight. Prison reform. We serve the crappiest food in the world in Canadian prisons. You could change it overnight. Mm -hmm. Why can't First Nations bands get clean water? Mm -hmm. There are 610 bands in the country. There are about 70 of them now under uh, uh, bottle warning, water warning. That could be fixed overnight. You write a check, fix the darn damn thing, you know. Um, that's what bothers me is in these instances of we know what the problem is. We know or at least have an idea what the solution is. And we don't do anything about it, especially with uh, prison reform. That's why we took the show into a prison. We took the show to Millhaven right. yeah. for a musical concert. It was wonderful. Michael, we're almost out of time, but I, I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, you, you now have some doctorates. Congratulations on that. Honorary. Thank you very much, yeah. Fred. That's wonderful. Uh, you're a member of the Order of Canada, and in part that was a recognition for your advocating on behalf of people with disabilities. So yeah, you know. that. you've won a whole bunch of other awards that I won't uh, that I won't bore you with. But you also ride horseback and ride a motorcycle. I wonder how many of your yeah. fans and followers know that. Uh, I'm about the motorbike, about motorcycle. I get quite a few. I get a lot of mail. Yeah. Um, I, a few years ago, back in the 90s, I would go out uh, to a, a ranch in Montana called the Shively Ranch and work with cattle. So you'd be in the saddle for 10 hours a day. I loved it. Uh, the motorcycle, because it's dangerous, is very appealing. You're that far from your mortality. Every time. Long. Michael, we are now out of time. And I would love oh, to talk to you for another two or three hours. This it went so fast, fast, Fred. It's fun. Uh, I do want to just take a second, though, and thank our viewers for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Michael Enright. I want to thank our uh, technical support team with Rogers TV, uh, the folks at the Midland Cultural Centre who make this program possible, especially our series supporter, Bales Deshaw Wealth Management, and our program supporters, Heather Janak and Nicole Woods. Michael, what a delight this has been. It's just a, a dream come true for me to speak to you. Well, it's an honor for me, I've got to tell you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. And to our viewers, join us next time when our guest will be Gord Lacko, who is a consultant to TV and movies about maritime movie making. So, Michael, all the best, and thanks for being with us. Thank you, Fred. Take care. We'll listen to you soon on your new program. I hope so. Thank you.